sometimes when we talk about the skin toxicities, it can get lost in translation for these patients when we start talking about, you know, nausea, vomiting, all those other things that probably the average person out there thinks about when they think of cancer treatment and they don't take into consideration how serious these skin toxicities can be and how they can quickly get out of control if they're not reported to the medical team in a timely manner. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing, from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Weimer, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS. And today we're talking with George Ebanks, a medical oncology nurse in the Cutaneous Oncology Clinic at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, about management of dermatologic complications. As a reminder, you can earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks so much for joining us today, George. Hi, Jamie, and thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here to discuss this topic with you. Wonderful. Well, to kick things off, let's start with talking about why it's important for patients with cancer to pay attention to their skin and be aware of changes that might occur as part of their cancer therapy. I would say the first step as nurses that we need to remember is when we begin to teach our patients, we need to make that learning assessment of their knowledge base or their health literacy because we take care of patients from a very diverse backgrounds. So for example, some patients don't really think of their skin as an organ, much less the body's largest organ and its various functions. The number one thing that I teach my patients is that it is their largest organ. It helps protect them from serious events. And we want to maintain that skin integrity because that's their first line of defense. So that's one starting point there. And I think that helps drive home the point to the patients when you do start to talk about skin toxicities that they need to take it a little bit more seriously because skin integrity is important in protecting them from opportunistic infections that could be otherwise avoided. And this would be vitally important if we are taking care of patients that are undergoing cancer therapies that could cause them to become immunocompromised or neutropenic, you know, from the standard chemotherapies. And that would also put them at higher risk to becoming septic from that infection that they may have been able to otherwise fight off. We also have to consider underlying skin conditions at their baseline that could be impacted. I really appreciate your initial comments, just helping patients to reframe how they view and consider their skin. I think it's common for patients based on just whether it's their experiences with family or friends or the way the media portrays cancer care is they'll go to some of those very extreme side effects, nausea, vomiting, potentially having pain from their diagnosis. And so I think often patients will go straight to those side effects. And certainly those are important if they are relevant to the treatment that they are receiving. But as you said, sometimes the skin integrity and the complications that can arise from the dermatologic complications can be just as severe and just as concerning. And so we have to reframe our patient's consideration of what they should be focused on, what they should be worried about. And as you said, we'll get to the details, especially with our targeted therapies or immunotherapies, we know that skin toxicities are actually becoming very common. So I think that's a great tip of just highlighting that for patients so that they consider the skin an area that they have to watch. So before we jump into the systemic treatment side effects, let's touch a little bit on radiation. Can you explore a little bit about the ways that radiation treatments can affect a patient's skin? Radiation actually has a couple of different dynamics that nurses and patients both need to take into consideration during radiation treatment. So one thing I would recommend is that we tend to focus on the acute phase of any radiation reactions that happen in the skin, you know, while the patient is undergoing treatment, which is obviously what we would be dealing with. However, it's very easy to get lost in translation that we also need to be teaching our patients about delayed 
and long-term side effects from the radiation impacting their skin. So one delayed and long-term complication that could happen is if they're not moisturizing properly, that skin can become fibrotic and almost similar to if you think of like scar tissue. And if that patient is ever facing a situation where they need surgery in that area, somewhere in the future, say it's some sort of recurrence or metastasis in the nearby field or whatever, that can actually complicate things for that patient further in the future. So it is just one thing that we as nurses need to kind of remember and monitor them throughout their journey, you know, in their follow-ups. It's just kind of making sure that we're keeping that re-education of the, the skin care, even post-radiation treatment. So I think more people will be, patients and nurses alike, would be more familiar with the acute phase, which is during treatment, like I mentioned earlier. And for most patients, that acute phase is going to start somewhere around the two-week mark, so approximately 10 fractions, and it's the pretty common side effect of radiation dermatitis. What we need to really watch at that point is for desquamation, and for any new nurses in our audience today, desquamation is the medical term for the skin peeling. So we can start to see some desquamation happening, and it can look very similar to a sunburn. And that's nothing alarming. You're just going to reinforce to the patient that they need to keep moisturizing their skin, keep the medical team, you know, informed if they start noticing any type of seriousness. The more important thing would be to monitor for what they call moist desquamation. And that type of desquamation tends to happen in anywhere that there's skin folds. So if the patient is receiving radiation to their breast area or their groin area, even their axillary areas, we have to be a little bit more aware for that moist discrimination because that is a serious threat to their skin integrity. We really want to make sure that we're keeping that dry, we're keeping that clean. We don't want that skin breakdown to happen where they could get an opportunistic infection. There's two more things that we need to talk about with radiation. So one thing to think about is this phenomenon called radiation recall dermatitis. It's not really well understood, but we do know that it tends to be linked to certain chemotherapies. Doxorubicin comes to my mind because I did work in sarcoma before, where doxorubicin is one of the backbones to a lot of our regimens. And we have to be very careful with the timing between the patient receiving the doxorubicin and ending that treatment and then moving them on to receiving radiation, because then that can cause a unexpected skin reaction, which hopefully it'll be mild if it were to happen, but it can be red and painful, sort of like the acute phase of the just standard radiation, but this is something that would be unplanned for. So just something to keep in mind. So if you're a nurse in the radiation area, just keep in mind the timing of these things so you can help advocate for your patients. The other one is more of a planned side effect that can happen. It's called radio sensitizing or radiation enhancement. So the way to explain this is we are combining a systemic therapy to enhance the radiation's effectiveness. Some common examples of this are pairing a taxane with the radiation therapy. You could also see in the head and neck cancer patient population, sometimes they will pair Herbitux or Cetuximab with their radiation. And this is all to make the radiation more effective for their cancer treatment but it can lead to more severe skin reactions. So it is something to monitor for in those patients. This is something where we deliberately paired it as compared to the radiation recall where it was not a deliberate and anticipated toxicity to happen. I think those are some really great comments. And even you started out as talking about not only the acute short-term side effects, but also not losing sight of those long-term side effects that can pop up differently. And I really like how you really highlighted that, you know, when I say I, I'm a medical oncology nurse. My clinical practice was in GYN oncology. And so that's my frame of reference is the medical oncology space. So I think I assume, and 
I'm sure that our colleagues in radiation oncology, nurses that work exclusively in that space are very familiar and they're very accustomed to not only seeing these side effects and teaching their patients on what to look for and how to manage them. But I think it's an important point to bring up because those side effects can sometimes be delayed or as you described, can be removed from the initial radiation. You know, when we're talking about the radiation recall or as you also expertly mentioned, the notion of radio sensitization and we're doing it intentionally, but just medical oncology nurses may not feel as sort of connected to those dermatologic complications if they're really associated with the radiation treatment, but we still have to know about them and be aware of them because sometimes there can be that distance from the actual radiation treatment. And so I think you brought up some great points for all oncology nurses, no matter what area you might specialize in, of just having an awareness of what the risks are for your patients if they've received radiation treatment at any point during their cancer care. So those are some great points to consider and to take home. So now let's move on to what I'm more familiar with, which is the more systemic treatments, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, these systemic agents. What are the typical dermatologic complications that we are accustomed to seeing with those types of therapies? Let's go ahead and break this down into categories to try to avoid any confusion for our listeners. I'm going to start with chemotherapy. Adoxyl is a chemotherapy that comes to my mind. It is in the doxorubicin family. It's actually liposomal doxorubicin, and it can create a very red, painful rash for the patient, which can lead to treatment interruptions, dose reductions, those types of things. It's not an emergency, but Obviously, the patients can be very uncomfortable, and we're going to have to address that for that patient. Now, I'd like to bring special attention to a certain drug called cetuximab. It's been around a really long time, and most people will refer to it as a chemotherapy, but in all truth, it's actually a targeted therapy. It is what they call an EGFR inhibitor. So it's not a true chemotherapy as far as when we think of like the cytotoxic cycles that chemotherapy does. So I just kind of want to make a mention of that because it's kind of there on its own. But this one tends to cause acne form rash. This is like a number one thing to watch out for with this drug for this patient population. And I mentioned it earlier when we were talking about radio sensitization for the head and neck cancer patient population. The next thing I'd like to turn to is immunotherapy. That's becoming used more and more frequently with more and more cancers now. That's kind of the big race in the cancer community is developing these immunotherapies because they tend to, when they work for most patients, they tend to work long-term for patients, which is a really good thing instead of just kind of stalling the disease for X amount of time. So when we went into a rash on the immunotherapies, the rule is it should only be about 25 to 30% of a patient's body surface, and it should be manageable. So you will tend to see with these patients that it tends to show up like the upper chest, the upper back, the upper arms. I've had patients show up with forearms and lower legs. But again, that still equates about 25 to 30% of their body surface. Every once in a while, I get the rare patient that they will actually have the rash showing up on their face. That's not the typical presentation, but it is something to be aware of because this is going to be managed by topical steroids more than likely. And the topical steroids that we would have them using on the rest of their body, we would not be recommending to use on their face. So we do have to be careful of that. The other thing that we have to think about with immunotherapies is do they have an underlying autoimmune skin condition like psoriasis, especially if their psoriasis is linked to psoriatic arthritis, because now, you know, their autoimmune condition off the charts for them and make them completely miserable. And we don't want to do that. We're here to help and not to harm. Uh, We also need to teach the patient that early reporting is very, very important Because if they start noticing that this rash should not be painful and it should not be blistering, that should be an emergency sign to our patients. And I like the way you said this earlier when we were talking, Jamie. I feel like sometimes when we talk about the skin toxicities, 
it can get lost in translation for these patients when we start talking about, you know, nausea, vomiting, all those other things that probably the average person out there thinks about when they think of cancer treatment and they don't take into consideration how serious these skin toxicities can be and how they can quickly get out of control if they're not reported to the medical team in a timely manner. We certainly don't want something like this turning into Steven Johnson syndrome or TENS. So those are the highlights of immunotherapy. And so the next one we're going to go to are the PO targeted therapies, which is kind of why I wanted to make that point earlier when I was talking about cetuximab, because that is an IV targeted therapy that is commonly referred to as chemotherapy. But now I'd like to move on to the oral targeted therapies, which are usually known as multi-kinase inhibitors or tyrosine kinase inhibitors. You'll commonly hear these referred to as MKIs or TKIs for any nurses that are new in the audience to this terminology. So these are usually associated with acne form rash. One teaching that really needs to be enforced by nurses to these patients is not to treat this as acne. Their skin is actually getting dried out because they really do look like they're getting acne. And it's usually on their face, usually their upper chest. And we don't want them going and getting benzoyl peroxide or anything like that. We really need to teach them that this is actually an effect of their skin drying out and they need to moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. They need to use gentle soaps, avoid hot, hot, hot water. You know, that's going to aggravate it. And the reason we really want to focus our teaching on moisturize, moisturize is because we do not want this rash to turn into something that their skin gets so dry that it then cracks, which then leaves room for an opportunistic infection to come in and create a problem for them. With the MKIs and TKIs, aside from the acne form rash, the other risk for side effects is the HFSR, which is hand-foot skin reaction. So you'll commonly see that abbreviated as HFSR. This can be very painful for our patients and impact their quality of life. This one tends to happen more on the soles of their feet, and so it's going to impact their weight bearing. You're not going to see this quite as much as happening on their palms. So we do want to think about the HFSR for these patients because it can impact their quality of life. Well, George, thanks for that overview. I mean, it is really interesting as you talk through starting with the chemotherapy and then moving on to the other treatment types. It did sort of take me back in time because, you know, I remember when Cetuximab first came out and it just seemed very bizarre to have that skin reaction. And you're right. You know, I think because it's IV, I still lump it into sort of quote unquote chemotherapy, knowing though that it is a targeted therapy. But it's very interesting just as these new classes of drugs have come out and just I think nurses, we are challenged to stay current on not only, of course, what the drugs are, how they work, but then just acknowledging that the side effect profile is going to be very different depending on what type of drug and kind of how its mechanism of action works. And so I think you did a great job of kind of giving an overview of those different classes. And as you mentioned at the end, the targeted therapies are where we're seeing a lot, a lot of these dermatologic side effects come up. And, you know, even going back to how we started our conversation today of just helping patients and nurses alike be able to recognize that we might say this, you know, these oral agents are sort of air quotes, well tolerated because they're not causing severe nausea and vomiting or severe diarrhea, or other things that require maybe fluids or things like that. So compared to what historically we were accustomed to in terms of tolerance to treatment, this seems much better. And it is, but that doesn't negate the fact that they still can be very serious if they're not noticed quickly or prophylactically addressed or treated once they do occur or escalated to the right level of care, as you mentioned, with Steven Johnson syndrome or the toxic epidermal necrolysis, the TENS, those things can become very serious quickly if not noticed and differentiated from just a bad side effect versus something more serious and indicative of true allergic or immune response that needs a higher level of care. So great job summarizing that. You concluded kind of with moving into some more specifics. So let's maybe tease that apart a little bit. How does the PPE or the palmar plantar erythrodysesthesia differ from hand foot since 
a skin reaction or that hand foot syndrome. I think we do sometimes use those terms interchangeably, but they're different. How are they different? That is a really great point. And I will be honest with you. I was very honored to be part of the ONS Skin Toxicity Guideline panel a couple of years ago. And that is where I actually learned the difference between the two, because like you said, most people will lump them together. But there is actually a difference. There's a difference in the histology. So I did kind of talk about this a little bit at the end of the last portion. So it tends to be linked to the causative agent and it tends to be dose dependent as well as whatever the chemotherapy agent is. There's also a higher risk in female patients to get this. A lot of people tend to think of Cape Cytobine when we talk about this skin reaction. So the presentation of PP is different. So it typically presents on the palms and soles and it's red and edematous and it's accompanied by neuropathic pain. So you'll, if you run into this or you have a patient that runs into this, it is very painful and they will complain of a burning sensation. The palms are often more affected than the soles and can progress to blistering with desquamation and ulceration. So it's really important that we teach our patients about this. They used to, and if you have access to this as a nurse, by all means, please use it. I do think that organizations are getting away from doing this, but the drug companies at one point were supplying skincare kits for patients that were on these treatments with this potential side effect that can really impact their quality of life. Not only is it painful, I remember I had a patient a few years ago that it was so painful for them. They actually had these really fuzzy little soft slippers and they came in in a wheelchair and we literally could not get the patient from the wheelchair to the exam table because it was just so painful for them to stand. Um, and have any pressure on their feet. So we want to make sure that we're teaching them to avoid wearing anything that can create like friction there on the soles of their feet and make this worse for them. So hand foot skin reaction, which is often abbreviated to HFSR, is different from PPE. And this is linked to the multi-kinase inhibitors or the tyrosine kinase inhibitors or MKIs or TKIs that we talked about earlier. And so this presents a little bit differently for patients. Some of the other risk factors to take into consideration with them are, we're gonna look at the female patients or at higher risk for experiencing this. Also, we have to think about certain baseline of their disease process, like do they have liver metastasis, the number of organs involved in their disease, as well as their tumor type and their pretreatment white blood count is within normal limits. A lot of these agents are like the BRAF inhibitors, like Vemurafenib. You're going to have your oral small molecule inhibitors. And usually when I teach these, I teach our nurses, if you look for the ending NIB, N as in Nancy, I, B as in Barbara, so NIB, if you see that at the end of a medication, more than likely it is a small molecule oral inhibitor. So that'll kind of tell you right there. So for instance, you've got medications like serafinib, and that was the medication that will cause this and pizopinib. So all those nibs, those are something to keep in mind. And so HFSR typically starts at onset within two to four weeks from initiation of the therapy, or it can be delayed as late as one to three months in the treatment. So this will present on the flexural and weight-bearing areas, such as the lateral aspects of the feet and the inner digital web spaces and tender lesions are often found in areas of friction. So again, we want to make sure that we're teaching them to avoid friction. You can also use urea-based moisturizers. Those are really great. Regular moisturizers don't seem to work quite as well for this side effect. So you can use like bag bomb, utter butter. So those are really good because it creates kind of a protective layer for the patients as well as helping to moisturize. 
Well, thank you for that reply. I think that's important to keep those two sort of conditions very similar, but still distinct. I think it's important for nurses just to understand that, even though those terms do get tossed around and interchanged, it's just important for us to stay clear on how they are different and what different types of therapies they might be associated with. As we move on just to more general rashes, you've mentioned a couple of times this idea of an acneform rash being a fairly common rash associated with many therapies. And you also explored a little bit the difference of that immune-related adverse event rash, the IRAE type of rash. So can you maybe go a little bit more depth on what those rashes, how they present, and how we can manage them? Yes. So with the acne form rash, the patient will present with, they really do look like they're having like a pimple outbreak. This is one where you're going to look at the amount of body surface area that is being impacted for the patient. You know, it should really be localized to like their face and maybe their upper chest. If it starts spreading beyond that, you know, like down their back, this is really uncomfortable for them. So we have to keep an eye on it. The biggest severe toxicity of this is if it starts to go into their mucosal membranes. So if you start noticing that it's going up into their nasal passages or it's starting to blister the mucosal of their mouth, the mucosal lining of their mouth, we really need to make sure that we jump on that, get our provider's attention so we can either dose reduce or treatment break, something like that. Hopefully we won't reach that level of severity in this toxicity. We really need to be proactive with these patients. So what we really want to do is we really want to reinforce the education that they need to moisturize, 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 moisturize. The other thing is, and we covered this when we were doing the skin toxicity guidelines skin panel, was there is no set rule on when to initiate a prescription intervention here. So you have some providers that they will start the patient off with prophylactic Oral doxycycline is the oral antibiotic of choice, and they can either do a topical clindamycin or they can do a topical steroid. So some providers will start that off prophylactically in the hopes that they can limit the severity of this particular toxicity for these patients that are on this drugs. So the other side of the coin is, and I think this may have to do with this era of antibiotic stewardship that we're in right now is some providers will wait until the patient actually starts to develop the acne form rash and then they'll prescribe the doxycycline and the topical clindamycin or the topical steroid. That's going to be the way that's going to get managed. And then we just need to keep an eye on making sure that this toxicity does not escalate to the point where it's covering too much of their body surface. We definitely, like I said, we do not want it going into their mucous membranes because that can be very dangerous. And if this gets too dry, then the skin will crack and it'll be exposed to possible infections that they could have otherwise avoided. With the immune-related rashes, those will typically like I said earlier, they should only be about 25 to 30% of the patient's body surface. They're typically going to, if they're not being relieved by over-the-counter lotions and creams, we're going to talk to our provider about topical steroids. So a lot of times you'll see these patients will end up on triamcinolone, mainly because the itching And I've had patients that they'll call me and they'll say, George, I'm ready to scratch my skin off. So we need to initiate this as soon as they start complaining about that. They can also use in combination. I've had patients use Zyrtec during the daytime because it doesn't make them as drowsy. So they might use like an oral antihistamine for the itching sensation. At nighttime, if it's interrupting their sleep, they might want to add some Benadryl to that to help them sleep and calm the itching down. So again, we're also going to teach them to avoid hot, hot showers or baths. We want them switching to gentle soaps. Keep this, even if they are on topical triamcinolone, by the way, you still want them to moisturize. So you want them to alternate that topical steroid 
with the topical moisturizer just because you don't want the topical steroid to then add to drying out their skin. And then we're going into another situation where we can impair their skin integrity because we're drying it out too much. If this does escalate, they're going to be initiated on oral steroids as long as this hasn't escalated to like a grade four type situation, which I think I mentioned earlier, like the Steven Johnson syndrome or the TENS, like that's a grade four situation. There's no time for oral antibiotics. This patient's going to end up hospitalized with IV antibiotics. So that loops back around to our role as oncology nurses and making sure that we educate our patients and don't let this get lost in translation about the importance of reporting to us any skin changes that they might find because the sooner that we can intervene and help them, the more likely we can keep them from getting admitted to the hospital and needing IV steroids. So we actually just recently had a patient that we, you know, I would say it was probably about a grade two toxicity for this particular toxicity and the triamcinolone wasn't quite controlling it for them. We ended up putting them on prednisone, like 40 milligrams and doing a taper. And this is another thing that we need to teach our patients is to, if we initiate that steroid taper for any side effect, because I there's probably nurses in our audience that are familiar with the steroids that we have to use for immune-related adverse events. But a good teaching point is to make sure that we teach our patients to please keep a journal because a steroid taper is not a steroid taper, is not a one-size-fits-all steroid taper, is what I teach my new nurses and my patients. Everybody responds very differently. For instance, this patient that I'm using as my illustration, they were great on 40 milligrams. They went down to 30 milligrams. They were fine. They went down to 20 milligrams. They were fine. They went down to 10 milligrams. The itching started to come back. They didn't report that to the team. They finished the taper and they were off the taper for about two days and they called and they were just absolutely miserable. So the provider reinitiated the steroid taper back at the same dose. Sometimes we'll bump up the dose depending on what's going on with the patient and the severity of it. I was actually helping a colleague of mine and I started doing this teaching of please, please, please keep a journal so that if this happens again, you know when this toxicity has started to come back. And that helps us as the medical team to say, okay, you were doing great at 40, we're doing great at 30, at 20, the side effects started to rear its ugly head. And now we're at 10 and it's really starting to flare up. We need to reconsider how we're doing this steroid, I'm sorry, the steroid taper for you so that we can try to get this under control for these patients. Yeah, I think that's really great. And I'm struck by, as we've mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes these dermatologic side effects, sometimes they're not life-threatening. They're not as severe as what other side effects are interpreted as being awful and intolerable. But what they can definitely do is impact quality of life. And if the quality of life is, I mean, it's not life-threatening, but it's making them miserable. And if we can't control these symptoms, then it will impact their ability to remain on treatment, which then, of course, that has an impact on the outcome. So I think just everything that you've mentioned about whether it's guiding them sort of preventatively to manage, to keep their skin hydrated, to use any prophylactic topical treatments or agents that are recommended, or if it's just a matter of honestly and accurately recording your the symptoms and reporting how things are changing or improving, it's important to emphasize to patients that it's really important for that information to come through to the care team so that we can make the right decision to help hopefully not only improve their symptoms, control them the best that we can, but most importantly, keep them on the therapy that, you know, we hope that will do good and will, you know, help to control their cancer. So again, it just highlights the importance while it's easy to think, oh, just, it's just little skin toxicity. This really, I think to me, drove home the importance of helping patients to understand how big of a deal this can be. Now, one thing that's kind of related to what you've already talked about, but, but we haven't really landed on specifically is the idea of agents or drugs that can cause photosensitivity and how that kind of presents as a toxicity. Can you explain just a little bit about that? Absolutely. I believe I mentioned one of the drugs that is linked to this. So this is really, from my experience, and I've seen it's really linked to the BRAF inhibitors, which are also becoming more commonly used. So I work with skin cancers. We use this for melanoma, but I do know they're being used in gastric cancers as well. One thing that we need to remember as nurses is the photosensitivity aspect of these drugs. We 
need to teach them that even if they think they're running outside for five minutes, they need to use SPF 30 or higher and keep as much of their skin covered as they possibly can. I live in Florida. People do not want to be wearing long sleeve shirts out in the summer here where it's like 90 something degrees and the humidity is through the roof. I understand that. But one example that I would use as an illustration is As a nurse, you cannot look at a patient and say that patient A is going to be more photosensitive than patient B. And the reason I will tell you this is we had a patient that had native Indian heritage, had a good baseline, you know, olive skin color, and they were driving from the neighboring county to us to come in for their check-in. And despite even using SPF 50, By the time they got to us during their drive with their arm in the driver's window, that arm would be sunburned. It would look like someone had taken neon pink spray paint and spray painted their arm. That is why I say stop and think about your biases as a nurse. You can't automatically say that a fair-skinned, blonde-haired, blue-eyed person is going to be more at risk than a dark-skinned person. So I would urge you as nurses to take that bias out of your mind because it's not true. There is no indicator that we can use. So the best thing you need to do is make sure you teach every single patient that you have on those medications. If it has, I think of BRAF inhibitors, there may be others that I'm not thinking of, but if you have a patient that you know is on a medication that can cause photosensitivity, it is really important that you teach them the proper way to protect themselves from the sun. Uh, The other thing that is unique to the BRAF inhibitors is you need to make sure that you are advocating that they are checking in with their dermatologist every three months. And if they don't have one, strongly encourage them to get one because when they're on the BRAF inhibitors while it's fighting their melanoma, it can actually make it easier for squamous cells and basal cell cancers to pop up, which can easily, if caught early, can be remedied in a dermatologist's office. So we don't want them ignoring that. That's what I would say about the photosensitive drugs. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think that is important, especially your comments just about eliminating any sort of assumptions on who would be at risk for photosensitivity because we're not talking about a sunburn. So somebody who might not burn easily, although even if you're not burning, you're still getting UV you know, exposure and there's a whole risk. That's a whole different topic. <laughs> but you're right that you know we should approach all patients equally to let them know the drug that they're on, what the risks are associated with that and equip them with the knowledge and the tips of how to prevent or to mitigate those side effects as best we can. So I think those are some great comments as well. No, so we've talked about skin, but let's talk a little bit about fingernails because I know that there are many treatments that present a unique risk to changes in fingernails. So what should nurses know about these fingernail changes? When can they occur and what should we be watching for and how should we teach our patients? So there are two nail toxicities that jump out right away. One is called the flag sign and this will be your patient that's on a oral agent, and it does tend to be one of those MKIs or TKIs usually, you'll start seeing bands in their nails. So it's actually in their fingernails, toenails. It tends to be more the fingernails. And you'll start to see bands developing in their fingernails. It tends to be more of a cosmetic concern that can cause some emotional distress for the patient. We have to give them some emotional support for it. It's not anything that's going to harm them. However, you don't want them going to their regular manicure or pedicure if this is developing because those estheticians are not going to be trained in properly caring for oncology patients that are on cancer treatment. And we certainly don't want them running into a situation that could then lead them to getting an infection that they would have otherwise avoided. So you just would want it. They can still clip their own nails, but you don't want them going to public places and getting like a manicure, pedicure if this is happening because the nails could be a little bit more brittle. The skin around it could be a little bit more easy to like nick and then they get an infection. But typically it's just more of a cosmetic concern for the patient to deal about. The other thing I would highlight with this though is 
also take into consideration your patient's nutritional status because the flag sign can actually be a sign of malnutrition. So you might, as the nurse, have to investigate a little bit deeper with this patient if they present with this particular nail toxicity. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind, that it may not be completely drug-related. It may also have another factor from their nutritional status. The one that really stands out for us to talk about is onycholysis, and this is where the nail starts to separate from the nail bed. And this can become highly dangerous for the patient. It certainly increases their risk of opportunistic infections and pain happening with them. When we were on the skin toxicity guidelines panel, one of the dermatologists that was on there, or oncodermatologist actually that was on there with us was saying how they had to remove the nail in certain really bad cases. And I can only imagine how painful that must be for the patient. And we want to avoid that. This particular toxicity does tend to be more linked to taxane-based chemotherapy regimens. What we can do is we can actually use cooling procedures. That may vary from facility to facility what they consider to be their allowed cooling procedure for this. The studies that we used was they would have an iced glove on one hand and no iced glove on the other hand. The other hand would be bare. At my facility, we use ice packs that are strapped to the tops of the patient's hands to decrease the severity of this toxicity. And it does work. How effective it works, you know, is going to vary from each patient, but We do need to watch out for this. The one thing also to think about, let's say you have a patient that's on carbotaxol. You would not be applying your approved cooling procedure to the patient's hands and feet during the carboplatin infusion because that's not the offending agent that's that's going to cause this toxicity. You would apply the cooling procedure to their hands and feet when you're actually doing the taxane infusion. So that's a key point to remember there. You wouldn't want to subject them to this coldness for the entire infusion. So it would just be for the offending agent, which will tend to be your taxane chemotherapy. And so they should definitely be taught to keep an eye on their nails, to let the medical team know right away if they start to experience discoloration, if they start running into any pain. It does tend to be more of the fingernails than the toenails, by the way, I will say, but I used to be a little overcautious and just do both, but it does tend to be more of the fingernails, just FYI. That's really interesting. I don't know that I've ever heard the nail flag term, but I think it makes sense. You know, you see these transverse bands of like alternating potentially white stripes or red stripes, like a flag. It makes sense. So thank you for sharing that. I learned something for sure from that. And I think, you know, again, it makes really important in good sense that we have to draw attention to this. Again, it's a small thing. Maybe it's just cosmetic. Hopefully it doesn't really progress to anything serious. But if we don't inform and give our patients that awareness of this is going to happen to your nails, especially I think in, I would say societal focus. And a lot of people are into having, you know, very nicely manicured nails, sometimes using acrylics or things. I mean, that's just, again, something that we have to proactively talk to our patients about, you know, how do you care for your nails? Do you go to, you know, a nail salon to get manicures or to get artificial nails or any of those designs and things like that? And so you had to have that conversation ahead of time of, you know, if they do it, should they stop? What do they need to watch for? And again, not probably the time to start that habit. So just seems very small, but it's just an important part of educating our patients appropriately. Even the assessment piece, you know, it's a very small piece, but if you have patients on these agents that are known for causing nail changes or nail toxicities, are you physically looking at their nails? Are you telling them to look at their own nails and to report changes? Because that is sometimes, I would say, an easy thing to overlook, but it's an important step for patients who are, especially if they're coming to us for infusions or getting their agents administered on site versus once they take it home, that nursing assessment piece is really important to catch those things early. Speaking of assessments, we've talked a lot about the education piece with nurses and what we should teach them, what should we teach our patients. But as nurses are doing these assessments, are there any specific tools or grading systems that you would recommend when assessing and trying to evaluate these dermatologic complications? 
so for assessment tools and grading, when I worked in radiation, our radiation accelerators, the entire software suite was ARIA. That's how they would actually design the patient's radiation treatment and deliver the radiation treatment was all linked together. The great thing was charting as a nurse, it would actually help you grade the toxicity for the patient when you're charting on them. So you didn't really have to think about it. But I would say not all EHRs are created equally. So I really do kind of miss that, that we don't use ARIA where I am now. So what you can do is you can refer to the NCI You'll hear the term CTCAE, and that's the common terminology for adverse events. And they have a really great, if you look under dermatological complications, they can tell you what is, you know, a grade one rash versus a grade four. Like I said, you know, like a grade one rash would be where it's like 25 to 30% of their body surface. You're able to control it with triamcinolone cream for the itchiness, that type of stuff. Then a grade two is like more than 30% of the body surface. You know, a grade four is something that's like life-threatening, you know, like Stephen Johnson syndrome or TENS. And we definitely don't want them to reach grade five because that's death. That's really the main assessment tool. So familiarizing yourself with that tool is really good. I would download a copy of that so that you have it handy and you can always like refer to it so that if you're ever in that situation where you're like, I'm not so sure how serious this really is and you're just needing a little bit of guidance on that, you can always refer to that guide. It's really helpful table that you can go to. And it actually does that for all toxicities. So no matter what area of nursing you're in or what type of side effect that you're concerned about, They have all of these side effects that is interesting, though. They don't have a difference in the PPE and the HFSR that we were talking about. They actually even lumped that together. (laughs) That was something that I found very interesting when I was writing the chapter and going through the data and everything. I think that's a great point of the CTCAE. Yes, that's great. I think we know a lot of primarily used with clinical trials again, but For the consistency, right? Because if we're all judging it sort of like, I think that's mild or that's moderate, but without any sort of guidelines on what's where's the threshold, what's the difference, it can be hard to track how a patient's symptoms are changing, whether that's for better or worse, if we're not using precise ways to describe what the symptoms we're seeing are, then it makes it hard to make those decisions on how to, you know, advise them or to potentially change their therapy or give different agents. So I think you're absolutely right. Even if your institution and your electronic health record doesn't integrate the CTCAE grading system, sometimes I've seen it just be more general of mild, moderate, and severe. But I think it's important, you know, for our nurses listening, if your center doesn't use the CTCAE, just trying to collaborate on, you know, how are we defining what we see and are we using the same system? Are we all grading things similarly? So that's important, I think, moving towards a consistent standardized way of grading things is certainly better for the data we collect and for the patient's care that we can provide by being consistent in how we evaluate and document what we see. Well, George, it's been a great conversation today. I've really learned a lot and I appreciate all of the information that you shared. But as we approach the end of our episode today, I do always like to ask just a few quick questions to help summarize what we've talked about. So to start that off, What are some common misconceptions about dermatologic complications? I think we really kind of summed it up that we want to make sure that when we're teaching our patients about the potential side effects of whatever their treatment is, that the dermatological complications that could potentially happen don't fall by the wayside or are taken less seriously than the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, those types of things. It's not so hard with medications like cetuximab because you kind of know like that's the one thing that's just going to come right out the gate for that patient. But with these other drugs like the MKIs and stuff that we've talked about, it's really easy to see a patient being underwhelmed with the potential of skin toxicities when they're hearing about nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, this other stuff. So I would say that's probably the biggest misconception. And one way I think that we can address that as nurses too is 
using the teach back method. So this is something that I really figured out early on before really being in the field with all the immunotherapies and everything is back when we were really just using chemotherapies and I was using the teach back method, I'd always be teaching the patient, you know, neutropenic fever. And I'm like, you need to call us at 100.4 or higher. And I would say probably about 50% of patients, and I would say, repeat that number back to me. Half of those patients would repeat back to me 104 degrees fever. That really set a light bulb off in my head on my patient teaching moving forward. And I would be like, that was my opportunity to correct them and make sure they actually heard 100.4 or higher. So one tool that I would encourage you to use, our nurses that are listening, is please use that teach chat method with our patients and have them repeat back to you what you've taught them and kind of keep an eye out, like, do they gloss over the rash that you talked about or whatever skin complication you talked about and they can tell you oh yes you know if i have three episodes of vomiting and the isofran's not working and i've got to call you and then they don't mention the skin toxicity that's a flag to you that you need to go back and kind of reinforce that yes i want you to call me if your vomiting is not under control but i also want you to call me if your skin starts to feel painful or whatever so i would say that's probably the biggest misconception and it can happen on the nursing side as well as the patient side i think that's a great tip for all teaching of course that we do of just it takes extra time it is an extra step it feels like but it is that opportunity to reorient a patient if they don't have it quite right to help intervene if they have it wrong. So it really does give you that last chance to make sure that what they are going to leave with, the information they're going to leave with is accurate and you know what you've told them. So I think that's a great tip to remember in all situations. Next question, what is something about this topic that's not discussed often, but you wish people knew more about? I think the medical community tends to hedge a little bit on how serious this can actually become. And in my experience, you do walk a very fine line of trying to help the patient understand that this can become very serious without scaring them to the point that they don't want to take the medication because now they're scared that they're going to end up in the burn unit. So I think that is an art that we all have to learn as nurses when we're teaching our patients is that fine line of where do I stop and make sure that this patient understands how serious this can actually become if you do not call us and let us know. Because you certainly, if you told a patient right now that there's a risk that you could get Stephen John syndrome and go into the burn unit, that they're going to absolutely be like, I don't think I want to do this. So we don't want to say that. So I think it's really nursing itself is a, both a skill and an art. I think we all know that. But I think when we start talking about these things, I think there's also a skill and an art to that, that we have to kind of find that line in our teaching with these patients that how serious this can actually become if they don't report them to us in a early manner so that we can intervene much earlier than having to hospitalize them. That's what I would say that's probably not discussed quite as much. Thank you for that. What about additional training or education? If oncology nurses need to understand or care for these types of dermatologic conditions in their own practice, what would you recommend? So a couple of things, you know, you can refer back to our skin toxicity guidelines that we published. I believe those 2020. There's actually uh, two versions of that that you can refer to. They made a really nice, quick clinical summary one for nurses because we're all busy when we're at work and we don't have time to read through all the literature and all that. So they made a nice one that you can quickly go to for certain. It's not comprehensive. We chose a few different dermatological complications and skin toxicities for that. The other thing that nurses can do is you can try to find CEUs or classes. I know that I teach a module for the oncology certification review and skin is part of my module. You know, that's another learning opportunity for nurses to just, you know, gain more education on this. Uh, so I would say those are some really good ways to just keep up on this because, like I said, immunotherapies and targeted therapies are really kind of becoming center stage now in cancer care for a lot of cancers, not all. And the chemotherapy is kind of becoming like 
you know, more second line, third line, those types of things. If the patients are failing their immunotherapy or targeted therapies. So just keeping up on that education is just going to be really helpful for the nurses in the audience listening and taking care of patients that are at risk for these complications. Wonderful. Thank you. I think those are some great recommendations. And we'll certainly link some of those resources in our episode notes today as well. George, do you have any final comments to share with our listeners today? I would just say, keep in mind when you're teaching your patients with these potential skin complications, just make sure that you're helping those patients not forget those out of the list of side effects that you're teaching them and just be aware of monitoring for them. Again, I like that we talked about using a consistent grading, right? So you don't have one nurse thinking that this is mild and this nurse is saying it's moderate. So I think just within your organization or your department, but really it should be your organization, there should be definitely some consistent grading happening there that everybody agrees upon so that the patient's getting the best care possible. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, George, for joining us today and sharing all the information. I certainly think nurses will come away from our episode with knowledge and uh, hopefully some confidence in how to better watch for these skin toxicities and also inform their patients and educate them so that they're prepared and ready to manage these side effects if they do become part of their treatment. So thank you again. I appreciate all of your time. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful to be here today. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part in this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guest and not necessarily ONS.